you're about to hear involves a once-in-a-lifetime scientific discovery. We have a full agenda today. Shortly, you'll hear from Syracuse University Chancellor Kent Siverut. You'll hear from the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Karin Rulant, and some of the world's most distinguished physicists. As the invitation indicated earlier this week, 100 years ago, Albert Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves. Today, we will hear an update about the search for gravitational waves from an international team of physicists, which includes more than 1,000 people from across the globe. The team includes faculty, research staff, and students from Syracuse University, some of whom you'll hear from today. Two members of the team are at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., where in just moments a live press conference will begin. Please join me now in turning your attention to the live feed from D.C., where a few members of the international team will share their findings. It's because we believe in the potential of the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Opening a new observational window would allow us to see our universe and some of the most violent phenomena within it in an entirely new way. Since the mid-1970s, the National Science Foundation has been funding the science that ultimately led to LIGO's construction. And in 1992, when then NSF Director Walter Massey and the National Science Board approved LIGO's initial funding, it was the largest investment NSF had ever made. It was a big risk. But the National Science Foundation is the agency that takes these kinds of risks. We support fundamental science and engineering at a point along the road to discovery where that path is anything but clear. NSF funds trailblazers. It's why the U.S. continues to be a global leader in advancing knowledge. So, without further delay, because I too am eager to hear the latest updates from LIGA's lead scientists, let's kick things off with a video and then go to Dave Reitze, for, uh, who is LIGO's executive director. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein uh, about 100 years ago, and they are dynamical perturbations in the fabric of space-time, ripples in space-time, if you will. The gravitational wave stretches space in one direction and compresses space in the other direction. Nobody really believed that you could ever detect them because the size of the effect is so small. I came to the conclusion that, yeah, if you made this long enough... Nobody had ever made something like this before, so there was a lot of technological challenges that needed to be overcome. That's what scientific discovery is really all about. You don't choose the simple things to do. We have done something which is brand new field is busted wide open. It's monumental. <laughs> it's like Galileo using the telescope for the first time. I looked at it and I thought, my God, uh, this, this looks like it's it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. I am so pleased to be able to tell you that. So these gravitational waves were produced by two colliding black holes, came together, merged to form a single black hole about 1.3 billion years ago. They were detected by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. LIGO is the most precise measuring device 
ever built. Let me start with what we saw. So on September 14th, 2015, the two LIGO observatories in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana recorded a signal nearly at the same time, nearly simultaneously, and the signal had a very specific characteristic. A characteristic of as time went forward, the frequency went up. And what was amazing about this signal is that it's exactly what you would expect, what Einstein's theory of general relativity would predict for two big massive objects like black holes in spiraling and merging together. Now it took us months of careful checking, rechecking, analysis, looking at every piece of data to make sure that what we saw was not something that wasn't a gravitational wave, but in fact it was a gravitational wave. And we've convinced ourselves that's the case and we're here to announce that, that today. But I do want to say something else. This, this is not just about the detection of gravitational waves. That's the story today. But what's really exciting is what comes next. It's 400 years ago, Galileo turned a telescope to the sky and opened the era of modern observational astronomy. I think we're doing something equally important here today. I think we're opening a window on the universe, the window of gravitational wave astronomy. So I'm going to show you two videos that are going to sort of tell you what we discovered. So the first video is the two black holes. So what you're looking at on the screen here are two black holes. Each of them are about 30 solar mass, have about 30 times the mass of the sun. All right, and you're looking, the black holes are the black things in the middle, and you're looking at the stars behind them. By the way, this is not a Hollywood production that I'm going to show you. It is actually a real computer simulation solving Einstein's equations for, for these merging black holes. So this is really what it would look like if you were in a spaceship close up. And I will also point out that the, the movie I'm showing you is vastly slowed down relative to what happened here. So let me start it. All right, you can see that as the black holes spin around each other, all right, the stars behind them are warped, and that's because of the black holes. So the press, press conference will continue in Washington, but we'd now like to shift the attention to the Syracuse team. To give you a better understanding of the significance of this discovery, please turn your attention to a short vid video featuring many of the university's gravitational wave group. Well, you're asking me, is this exciting? It's fantastically exciting. This is a once-in-a-generation type of discovery in, in physics or even in science. I think it was way better than any of us were thinking. We thought we would find something that we might just be able to see, whereas this signal is honkingly loud. It was way better than anything we were ever expecting. I think it's incredible. I thought that, you know, maybe we could detect something, but everyone kind of said, oh, no, it's, it's very unlikely. So the gravitational waves that LIGO saw uh, came from two colliding black holes about 1.3 billion years ago. Um, so which means they've been traveling through the universe for about a billion years until they reached Earth. The history of SU's involvement goes back to the earliest days of Syracuse University becoming a research university. The physics department hired several star physicists to create uh, uh, research programs here. One of them was Peter Bergman, who had worked with Einstein on relativity. One of the people who was a student of Peter Bergman's was Josh Goldberg. We were the first physics department in the United States where Einstein's theory of general relativity was studied. We can't just move ourselves and make gravitational waves because gravity is so weak. We have to look at very heavy objects moving at nearly light speeds to be able to see any type of gravitational waves. And that's why we look towards astrophysical sources. Many stars, in fact most stars in the universe, are in binaries, two stars orbiting around each other. So if you imagine those two stars, they evolve, they exhaust their nuclear fuel, they go supernova, they collapse down to compact objects, and you end up with two black holes orbiting around each other. As they orbit around each other, the massive changes they produce in the curvature of space-time generate gravitational waves that can be detected here on Earth. It 
LIGO consists of two uh, large installations, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. They have to be running at the same time uh, for us to be able to believe we've seen a signal. So this is an L-shaped configuration where laser light is shone um, down an L-shaped configuration, which we call the arms, and the arms are typically four kilometers long. So I like to think of it as um, soldiers marching in time. So soldiers marching in time coming from the laser and they, end, they get to a mirror which we call the beam splitter. And this is this uh, mirror that perfectly splits the laser into two. So they continue stepping in time. They get to the end of the, um, end of the arms, they bounce off the end mirrors four kilometers away, turn back around and march perfectly back in time back to the beam splitter. But one of the nature, one of the main things about a gravitational wave that's inherent to it, is it does cause stretching and squeezing of space time. So what it will effectively do is if we have an L-shaped configuration um, where the arms are and a gravitational wave comes down, it can cause one arm to increase in length and another arm to decrease in length. So it's kind of this stretching and squeezing kind of motion. So if the soldiers are marching down these two arms, um, and one arm suddenly gets slightly longer and another arm gets slightly shorter. When they recombine at the beam splitter, when they get back to marching together, they'll be slightly out of step with each other. And this means the gravitational wave has gone past. The kinds of signals that we're looking for involve moving one mirror at the end of that two and a half mile long arm by an amount uh, that's about one thousandth of the diameter of a proton. That precision is about the same as if you would set out to measure the distance to the nearest star down to the width of a human hair. It's so clear that with only a little bit of filtering, you can hear it in headphones when you play the data back. You can see it in a graph. We were expecting to have to use every statistical and computer trick that we knew to just tease out the barest evidence of something and the signal just sort of shouted at us. The discovery of these two binary black holes crashing into each other is really just the beginning of a whole new field of gravitational wave astronomy. And it's going to open up many opportunities for new research from nuclear astrophysics to strong field gravity, all these exciting areas that capture the imagination of students. We're just at the beginning here. We know these signals exist now. We can get some information from them. We have no idea what's going to happen next. I've gained a lot of experience in terms of uh, skills that I can take to grad school from this group. It's very rare that you get to be a part of something this big that will you know, very likely be nominated for a Nobel Prize. This goes back to the textbooks. This is what you learn about as a physics student. You, you read these things and this is going to rewrite those textbooks. They're, this is going to be the example that says, Gravity waves exist, and this was the moment they were discovered. Before we proceed to the speaking portion of our program, please join me in congratulating the physicists from the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, those, that team has been uh, an incredible work, working group in bringing this set of amazing findings together. Those team members include Peter Salson, the Martin A. Pomerantz Professor of Physics, Duncan Brown, the Charles Brightman Endowed Professor of Physics, and Stefan Ballmer, Assistant Professor of Physics. You'll hear more from Peter and Duncan in just a moment. Stefan is in DC attending the press conference you saw just moments ago. And now it gives me great pleasure to invite Karen Rulant, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, to the stage. Please welcome Dean Rulant. Thank you, Peter, and good morning, everybody. I'm thrilled that so many of you could join us today for this exciting announcement and panel discussion. The significance of this discovery speaks to the power of science to solve long-standing fundamental research questions. That Syracuse University was part of this project speaks to our growing prominence as a world-class research university. 
I'm especially honored that three of our own physicists from the College of Arts and Sciences were instrumental to this work. So, a very big congratulation and thanks to Professors Peter Solson, Duncan Brown, and Stefan Baumer for their terrific work. In a moment, you will also hear from the students who were instrumental in this research discovery. The College of Arts and Sciences is the intellectual heart and soul of Syracuse University. It is home to scholars across the academic spectrum, from the humanities to the hard sciences. And we are committed to hiring and retaining outstanding faculty and support them in what they do best. One of the university's top priorities is to advance its standing as a world-class research university. The breakthrough you just witnessed makes it very clear that the College of Arts and Sciences plays an integral role in achieving that goal. It is also evidence of the crucial importance of broad collaboration. This discovery solves one of the big, long-standing questions in physics. Such questions are larger than one university. They transcend countries and continents. It is fitting, then, that the research team behind this tremendous discovery were part of an international community of science, scientists, all of them combining their expertise and resources in a common purpose, to try to illuminate one of the persistent unknowns of the universe. That kind of ambitious undertaking requires an extraordinary amount of intellectual firepower, resources, and support. The willingness of this international team of scholars to collaborate was absolutely critical to their success. Of course, as a university, students are the primary focus of everything we do. And world-class research generates tangible benefits for them as well. It teaches that knowledge is dynamic. It requires students to be curious and tenacious. It allows students to work side by side with terrific scholars, teachers, and mentors. And it cultivates in them a hunger for discovery and knowledge that will serve them all their lives. Many of our own students helped to support this research. It is that kind of experiential learning that is a defining quality of an outstanding liberal arts education. This is a proud moment for the Department of Physics the College of Arts and Sciences, and the entire university. Congratulations again to this terrific team of scientists and to all of you for coming out to help us, us recognize and acknowledge their success. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Rulant. Nearly two years ago, during his inaugural ad address, Chancellor Sivarut said, and I quote, we must empower research excellence at Syracuse, uh, adding that great research, research is based in collaboration that draws in students and faculty. Those words couldn't be truer today as we celebrate the work of an intrepid team of professors, research scientists, postdoctoral fellows, and graduate and undergraduate students. All of them exemplified Chancellor Sivert's commitment to innovative scholarship, to affirming Syracuse's role as a world-class private research university. Please join me in welcoming Chancellor Kent Sivert.
Thank you, Peter Venable, who's uh, been a wonderful interim dean of the graduate school and vice president for research at Syracuse University. Uh, and I also thank Corinne Roulant for her remarks and her great leadership of arts and sciences. Good morning to all of you. Welcome to a great research university. I get asked a lot by people what that means, what it means to be a great research university, and today we all have an answer. It's when faculty and students and staff collaborate to give the whole world a new way to understand the universe. For that great gift, I join the others who've spoken in thanking an outstanding team at Syracuse University that helped this outstanding team worldwide. I thank the spectacular physicists from the College of Arts and Sciences, Professors Peter Salson, Duncan Brown, St Stefan Ballmer. I thank the members, all the members of the Gravitational Wave Group, which includes undergraduates and graduate students, as well as research staff. I thank the members of the university's information technology services for the important role they played in supporting the scientists in this effort. And I especially thank the leaders of arts and science and of physics who have supported gravitational wave research in physics for the last 60 years in good times and in hard times. This really is a great day for Syracuse University, for the great partner institutions that we joined in this research and for the global scientific community. It's really a day for awe and wonder Almost all of us have gazed up at the stars and marveled at the wonders of the universe that we can see, but so much has been unseen and unobservable. And now, due to this research, due to this detection of gravitational waves, a whole new universe has been opened up to us. I know this is such a dream come true for physicists around the world and for scientists. I know the scientists involved in this work have had a once-in-a-lifetime discovery I know there's so many new fields of inquiry that will be opened by it. I'm really grateful to all at this university who had the foresight and the determination to support the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory for the last 25 years. I know it's an amazing blessing that our students, both graduate and undergraduate, had a hand in this work. I am particularly amazed that researchers at Syracuse have helped complete Albert Einstein's unfinished business. I am so convinced by this experience of the importance of universities and departments working together to discover the un unknown and to answer timeless questions and to do so working for the long term. Today is a day of discovery that defines a great university and now there are a million new questions to pursue. That's the thrilling nature of a university. It's why we're also privileged to be part of this one. Please join me now. We haven't really done this in the right way. I would like us all to stand and congratulate all the researchers who made this happen. So. I would like to conclude in saying that I have never seen so many physicists in ties in my life. So, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Sibrud, for your inspirational words and for your unwavering support of research at Syracuse University. This is a proud moment for all of us, a new milestone in an era of gravitational physics. It's been said that research is less about what you discover and more about what you learn about yourself and the world around you. Our team of physicists has spent quite literally years on this project, working in labs around the globe amid considerable trial and error. Much of it has been done quietly and with little fanfare. One person who understands the rigors of scientific research is Professor Peter Salson. 
the inaugural Martin A. Pomerantz Professor of Physics. One of the founders of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, he is a lesson in humility. A leader who is a, has a soft tenor, but uh, strong in his convictions about teaching and research, he also is a remarkable visionary. Please join me in welcoming Peter Salson. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. It means so much to all of us that uh, you've joined us today for this really exciting announcement. It's an announcement that fills me with awe and with gratitude. Let me start with awe. As you just heard from the LIGO Executive Director, David Reitze, Advanced LIGO has let us listen to the thunder generated as two black holes, each 30 times as massive as the sun spun madly about one another and finally crashed together, forming a brand new, larger black hole. After these remarks in our panel discussion, we invite you to try on headphones at one of our explanation stations to listen to that faint but unmistakable sound. I urge you to pause and wonder as you listen. At first, it doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind that you're listening to a sound of an event that is reaching us from over a billion light years away. This is the first rumble of what is destined as advanced LIGO reaches its full capability to become a roar of new information about the universe. I am awestruck by this universe of ours, vast enough and strange enough to contain objects as weird as those black holes. I'm in awe as well at the human capacity to understand the universe at the vision of Einstein, who provided the framework for this understanding 100 years ago, at the insight of Einstein's early followers, among them Peter Bergman, a former assistant of Einstein's who founded the Syracuse University Relativity Group, and Bergman's student, Josh Goldberg, who pioneered the study of gravitational wave emission from binary stars. Josh has been a constant presence in the physics department to this day, and he's here with us. And Josh, could you please stand and accept our recognition? <laughs> Finally, I'm in awe of the skill and spirit of a team of 1,000 intrepid souls from across the country and around the world who together accomplished a measurement that sounds impossible. To hear those black holes thunder, we learned how to set up mirrors four kilometers apart and then measure changes in that four kilometers by an amount as tiny as 1,000th the diameter of a proton, as you saw a bigger version of me say a few minutes ago. I'm equally filled with a spirit of gratitude today. Firstly, gratitude to that team for their unflagging efforts stretching over many years. I'd like to ask everyone who is here who is a past or present member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration to please rise and be recognized. These folks are the core of the 1,000 intrepid souls, let me tell you, these guys are great. Now, for those of you who weren't standing, I hope you got a good, good look at those folks because the people who stood are going to be at various stations during the reception. They can't wait to ex help share their knowledge of this event with you all to help you understand, understand better what it means. Beyond my gratitude to them, I'm incredibly grateful to their families. They've sacrificed a great deal so that their loved ones could work towards this remarkable discovery. I'd like to ask all family members of LSE members who are present to please rise and be recognized. <laughs> this accomplishment would not have been possible if wise leaders had not created the conditions 
that allowed the team to work towards this goal. We are all deeply grateful for the support we received from Syracuse University and its College of Arts and Sciences starting years ago and continuing up to this moment, including a huge investment of computing resources that enabled this tremendous discovery. In addition to Chancellor Sibirud, uh, Interim Dean and Interim VP Vanable and Dean Rulant, we have here with us today Interim Provost Liz Liddy, former Arts and Sciences Deans Sam Gorovitz, Catherine Newton, and George Langford, and former Vice President for Research Gina Lee Glauser. Could all of you uh, please rise and accept our thanks for the help that you've given us over the years. Finally, we feel an immense amount of gratitude to those who've helped fund this research. I'm very grateful to the Pomerantz family for their support. And I know I speak for Duncan Brown in expressing his gratitude to the Brightman family. And all of us extend our sincere thanks to everyone who pays taxes. <laughs> the National Science Foundation which funds the research that we're celebrating today, gets its money directly from the American people, that is you. Everyone present today has, over the past two decades, contributed somewhere between the cost of a latte and the cost of a movie ticket to make LIGO possible. From all of us to all of you, profound thanks. We hope that you feel that you've gotten your money's worth from LIGO's discovery. Since you all supported us patiently over these years, we hope that you will take this opportunity to get something back. Please, during the question and answer period, ask questions of the panel. Then, during the reception, ask more questions of the team of scientists who are anxious to share this discovery with you. Let me point out what we have set up for you. There's a station over there where you can listen to the signal we detected through headphones. TJ Massinger will be your guide there. You can also, at that station there, try your skill at finding black hole signals in detector noise by playing the black hole hunter game. Ryan Fisher and Show Me Day will be, help, will be there to help you. Over there, you can learn about general relativity by interacting with a model spacetime. Hannah Fair and Mike Senatore will explain how to understand it. At that station, Laura Nuttall and Chris Bewer will give you a slide tour of the LIGO interferometer so you can see some of the technology that was used. And back in that corner, over by the refreshments, we have a simplified tabletop model of a LIGO interferometer. You can see how it works with the help of Ben Lackey and Fabian Magana Sandoval. And uh, our last but not least station over there, uh, you will be able to explore what happens in a simulation of a black hole collision. Shweta Bhagavat, Stephen Reyes, and Lorena Magana Zertuche will explain it to you there. So in closing, I'd like to mark this occasion by presenting our special guests, and I'd like Peter Vanable to stand in for the rest of our special guests. We have commemorative LIGO t-shirts emblazoned with the, uh, the waveform of the gravitational wave signals that we found on September 14th. So will you, on behalf of everyone uh, important present here today, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. You're a credit to the Department of Physics, to the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, and to Syracuse University. Let's give Peter and his entire team another round of applause, please. This concludes the formal uh, speaking portion of the program. We'd now like to turn up the lights and ask Alan Middleton, uh, professor and chair of physics, and others to join us on stage for a brief Q&A. This is your chance to ask this amazing group as a physicist a set of questions that may help you to understand the phenomenon better that we're talking about today. Alan has graciously offered to moderate what is sure to be an engaging conversation conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Alan Middleton. In just a minute.
getting mic'd up. He'll be right here. Thank you, Peter. Thanks to all, so much to all of you here for being part of today's excitement. And again, congratulations to the Gravitational Wave Group. In a moment, I'd like to start the panel discussion so that we can hear more about this tremendous achievement and its deep connections with the mission and activities here at Syracuse University. I first want to reinforce briefly Peter Salson's expression of gratitude. The College of Arts and Sciences and the university has supported our gravity group over many years. The support has allowed us to hire faculty through international searches, to equip laboratories, and in turn to bring in research grants and hire students. Information and Technology Services has assisted this work by providing supercomputing resources. Previous chairs, staff in our department and outside, and colleagues have created an environment where research flourishes. All of this has made our faculty and students a central piece of the international LIGO effort over the years, leading us to meet here today to celebrate this revolutionary discovery. I hope that all of these people, those whom Peter Salsa named and many of the others he referred to, realize how important their own contributions have been. Thank you. This type of support is essential to the research mission across the university, including successes, other successes in physics and other departments across the university. I also want to say that I can't help but reflect on how wondrous this discovery is. This morning, I recalled one summer as an undergraduate student working the night shift in a 24-hour restaurant near my home. When it was past 2 a.m. and quiet, I sat in the kitchen and read a thick text on gravity. I was fascinated by the complex equations that describe black hole physics and the ideas about waves. But it wasn't quite real since those waves were so impossibly hard to detect. If during those nights I had imagined sharing with all of you today, today's announcement, it would have been science fiction to me. Because when, from hu when humans first watched the sky, up to the morning of this past September 14th, almost all of our information about the universe came from light waves. You are hearing today of a totally type, different type of radiation, gravitational radiation. We now have an absolutely independent way to sense the workings of the universe. Someone has turned off a mute button. This new sense has already led to remarkable discoveries about black holes. Again, almost science fiction. So I'd like now, and I'm very pleased to introduce the members of this panel of experts, including many of the representatives of the nearly two dozen LIGO members here at the university, as well as the uh, ITS. So we uh, have Samantha Usman, an undergraduate in the Department of Physics. She's a senior this year. We have Duncan Brown, uh, the Charles Brightman Professor of Physics, Thomas Vo, a graduate student in the LIGO group, Peter Salson, the Walter Pomerantz Professor of Physics, Martin Pomerantz Professor of Physics, <laughs> Laura Nuttall, a research associate in the LIGO group, and Eric Sador, Associate Chief Information Officer. Thank you. So I'm going to ask this panel about the impact of this event. So it is true that two black holes colliding at 60% of the speed of the light, briefly emitting more energy at a, at a rate 50 times that of the rest of the stars in the universe, has a rather immense physical impact. But to explore its impact on our knowledge, how it affects our future, Let's start with a few questions that I'm sure some are here wondering, and then the panel will take questions from the audience. So I first want to ask all the members of this panel, uh, the details, and anyone can speak up first, the details of this breathtaking scientific discovery have been revealed. What does this discovery mean? Peter? Um, what does it mean? It means we're at the beginning of a new era of astronomy, first and foremost. Uh, there are lots of black holes out there. We just found that first pair. We're going to find a ton of them. We're going to be able to just see the whole universe in an entirely new way. 
and that's a tremendously ex exciting thing for all of us. So that's that's a kind of meaning that that means a lot to me. Pam. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited because once we've detected this first gravitational wave from two binary black holes, there's gravitational waves that we can detect from all different sorts of phenomena, such as binary neutron star systems and from supernovae and from perhaps even inflation. So we'll be able to um, learn a lot about space and about our universe from gravitational waves that we detect in the future. Would anyone else uh, like to say anything about what this means? What, what it means to science, beyond science? <coughs> so, I mean, I, I just want to echo what, <coughs> I'm losing my voice after uh, singing from my computer for three days. Um, <laughs> so uh, I just want to echo what people said. This, is, this really is the beginning of something. This is, you know, we've, we've put the capstone on Einstein's theory of relativity. We've proved the last remaining piece of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And with that, we can move forwards and we can do incredible new astronomy from, from nuclear astrophysics. I have a platinum ring on my finger. We don't know where the platinum in the universe comes from. We think it might come from uh, neutron stars crashing into each other at significant fractions of speed of light. With gravitational waves, we can probe that. So this really is just the beginning of a whole new field, building on the work that's, that's been proceeding. And it's just incredibly exciting that we can now do this. Uh, maybe Thomas could answer this question. Uh, next question here. Uh, what were your thoughts when you realized what the group had detected? Um, the first thought that came through my mind was making sure that everything was checked and double checked to make sure that we've got this is the right gravitational wave signal and it's not some random noise source. But, you know, after the collaboration and many scientists at Syracuse went through their own checks, we actually found that this was real. And, you know, I was in awe, really. I mean, it was amazing. And it was like a true testament to the people before me, people like Peter Salson and Duncan Brown and Stefan Ballmer, who, you know, laid the foundations for this discovery. You know, this was not an accidental thing. This was many years in the making. Right? And, and it was well deserved. So, Laura, when you saw this honkingly loud signal, <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to let this one die. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> What, what were you thinking? I think I went through so many emotions of, oh, wow, and no, 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 I don't believe it. I just kind of kept going through that constant cycle of, like, um, like Thomas was saying, that I think everybody had that moment of, like, oh, wow, we've actually got something. Um, and for me, that, that didn't really happen, I think, until about three weeks after the um, detection actually came in. I first saw the signal, and I thought it was too good to be true. I really genuinely did. I then went about starting to look at every kind of nook and cranny that I possibly could to find something. And it was only really when the um, kind of the flagship search that people work on here came back and said, this event is golden. It is the chance of it happening by chance is one in 200,000 years, better than that. That's it. That was, that was it for me. I was ready to accept it and slowly seep in that, yeah, we've opened up this new area of astronomy. It's exciting. And maybe, Eric, could you tell us a bit more about Syracuse's involvement in the development of LIGO in this discovery? Sure. Uh, we're, we're certainly humbled to be, uh, from the IT perspective, to be a part of this. Uh, our contribution was really working with Duncan and his, uh, his uh, group to, to provide computational resources. So we combined the, the, the green data center along with uh, some of the the, the, the pieces that it already put together in terms of support research computing, along with great collaboration with this, this group here, to, to really work together on the analysis of terabytes and terabytes of data, uh, to, to uh, very in an in a, in a honoring way be a part of what is a great discovery today. And, and just to answer the previous question, Alan, I, I got a sense of the impact of this when Duncan came to my office to tell me about what had happened, and I went for the handshake of congratulation, and in return I got a hug. So I got, <laughs> that gave me the human element of what was happening that maybe is outside of the ring of, of the, the physics world that, that really get a grasp on this. Okay, before we open up this Q&A, because I really would like to give people a chance to ask questions, um, I'd throw this out uh, for anyone to, to take a shot at. Uh, how do you think this discovery will affect students? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can give it a shot. I, <laughs> You know, as a grad student coming into LIGO and previously worked at Hanford for a few years, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to improve the instrument, to do much more science and, you know, a 
observe more objects that we're not quite sure about, like Duncan said, neutron star, binary neutron stars, or Sam said, um, you know, physics from the early universe. And so, given that opportunity to explore, puts a lot of excitement as a you know as a grad student, and I'm you know really really just happy to be part of it. Sam, um, well, I'd like to say there's two different. Sorry, this microphone. <laughs> there's two different ways that we can learn um, from this. And there's one, like the regular ast astronomy students are going to be able to learn so much more about the universe from what we can uh, learn from all the new gravitational waves we will be detecting in the future. And then there's students like me and Thomas and all the other students that work with us um, in the physics department who will learn by hands-on being involved in LIGO research. I, Thomas and I have both learned so much from doing LIGO research that we would have never learned in the classroom. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Well, I could say you. one other thing oh, yes, please, uh, on this question. Yeah. Um, I think in a way, this event today is a graduation ceremony. We are the old guys surrendering this new <laughs> field of science over to the younger generation who are gonna carry it forward. So uh, you're welcome to it. <laughs> and, uh, do, do good work. <laughs> Okay, so could we open this up to questions from the audience? And I'm not quite fully sure what the procedure is supposed to be here. Oh, uh, there is someone with a mic over there. There's another mic over there, I suppose. Hi, uh, I'm the father of Lon Pekowski, who's worked uh, on this project. And uh, from a personal perspective, I'm so uh, happy for him. I know it's meant a great deal to him, and I want to thank all of you uh, mm -hmm. for this great accomplishment. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I have is, uh, is there any single focus now going forward that you uh, foresee? In terms, of, in terms of the focus going forwards, I think both Peter and I will be admit to being surprised that we saw black holes first. I think we were both expecting to see um, binary neutron stars. So when a star exhausts its nuclear fuel, it collapses down to what we call a compact object, and a, a binary a neutron star is, a, is an atomic nucleus about the size of Manhattan. So it's a giant city-sized atomic nucleus. Uh, a black hole is even more compact. It's just pure space-time curvature, as you'll see from the demo if people explore the demo. And we were expecting to see binary neutron stars first, because that's what we knew existed. No one had ever directly observed before September 14th, 2015, no one had ever directly observed the existence of a black hole. So black holes were much more speculative sources. So I think the fact we've seen black holes first and we're seeing them really loud means we can start doing um, precision tests of, of general relativity, understanding the nature of gravity, which is the least understood of the forces, much more quickly than I thought we would be doing with LIGO. So there's gonna be a lot of focus on really understanding the fundamental nature of gravity and then you know, as we expect to see more binary neutron stars, neutron star black hole, even looking at towards the beginning of the universe, towards gravitational waves from the Big Bang in a few years' time, there's just a whole wide field out there that, that, that's ready to be explored. And from an experimental standpoint, I want to add that LIGO sensitivity is continually getting better. So even as we speak, people at the site are working at making the instrument more sensitive, and so uh, we have a better chance of getting more objects that we can detect. Hi. So uh, from the best I've been able to tell from looking at the dates on the press releases and such, it seems like this super amazing detection of gravitational waves happened shortly after putting advanced LIGO on last September. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, commenting on just sort of like how quickly it was found after the system came online and what that means about how often we might be detecting events. Um, and perhaps something that you're not privileged to comment on just yet, September was a while ago, and, and I doubt that you turned LIGO off <laughs> on September 15th or 16th. So uh, I'm curious if there's going to be, you know, more news coming soon. We're curious too. <laughs> <laughs> um, more, more seriously, yes, you're, you're right. That was the very beginning of the O1 observing run. Uh, 
we are reporting today on analysis of the first 39 days. Uh, the 01 run continued until January 12th. The analysis of the rest of 01 is in process. Um, we are as interested as you to see what comes out of that. And what, one of the reasons we're reporting the September 14th events now is just how careful we have to be at checking to make sure this, this is real. One of the things Eric said about the DITS contribution, and Laura mentioned this number of one in 200,000 years. What we measured is you would have to wait 200,000 years to get something this loud just, just by chance. And that, it's, it's much bigger than one in 200,000 years. That's just a limit of what we can measure. For the people who care about statistics, it's, it's much bigger than five sigma. Um, this, is, this is, sorry, Laura, honkingly loud. <laughs> but to look for weaker signals in the data, we have to do a lot of careful analysis. We have to do a lot of careful checking. We have to do a lot of computer processing to extract those signals from the data, and that's what we're doing right now. So we'll, we got really lucky that we turned it on and we got a screaming loud signal that, that right after we turned it on, it was all calibrated and ready to go. We're working on the rest of the run now. And your comment on how quickly we were able to turn on advanced LIGO, and when I say turn on, I mean many months of actually making it work, but it's also a great testament to the foundations laid by initial LIGO where there were a lot of lessons learned by the experimentalists that understood the machine. And now, during the upgrade, we were able to make that work much, much faster, at a much faster pace, right? So it doesn't surprise me. It really doesn't, that it works that well. We have a question here. First, I, I just want to say that this is inexpressibly exciting. Um, we're well aware that this is an immense event in physics and astronomy. I wonder if you have any thoughts about its potential impact on or potential for interaction with other disciplines outside physics. Anyone go? Um, well, let, let me say thank you, Sam, for, for those remarks and for a challenging question. Um, perhaps, you know, these sorts of things take time to sort out, actually, okay? Um, but I'm guessing that perhaps the, the, one of the biggest impacts will be the, the vividness with which we brought black holes into our picture of the universe. Black holes are remarkably strange objects. Um, and there's, there, there's, there's strangeness. We are still learning more and more about how strange they are. So I think that that the fact that with LIGO, we can, in effect, go up and touch a black hole, not with our own fingers, but with that other black hole that banged into it, will take them once and for all outside the realm of the speculative or the maybe, the whatever, and, enth and, enth and enthrone them permanently as a, as a key element of the universe. And then the bizarre properties of uh, the, the strange intermixing of space and time, all the information paradoxes, the question of black hole evaporation, what they say about possible quantum theories of gravity and their new views of the nature of the universe, I think it will, it will, it will permeate culture through, through that way at least. Nothing of the Big Bang, yes. Maybe we have a question. So you have two, two sensors at two different locations. And in the report, it said there was a time shift between the two signals. Can the information be used to get direction? Okay. Yeah. Laura, do you want to take that? Yeah, so um, we can use several techniques, but the main one is triangulation, which is, like you said, the time of arrival at each um, observatory. And with that information, with some extra checks that we can do in terms of the phase and the amplitude of the signal at each site, we can coordinate that to a kind of a ring on the sky. Um, and we can kind of narrow it down slightly. So I think with this signal, with its loudness, we could um, localize to about 600 square degrees. Now, that is really quite large. Um, I think the um, square degree of the, the moon is something like um, a quarter, something along those lines. So it's the field of view of a typical electromagnetic telescope is much, much smaller than that area. So right now, at the sensitivity that we were, it's not an amazing localization. But as we become more sensitive, that area will shrink. And also the Virgo interferometer in Italy is hopefully coming online this year. 
And with the third detector in the mix, with triangulation from that as well, we'll kind of shrink down and shrink down. So hopefully by the time we get to design sensitivity around 2018 era, we should be down to um, kind of rapid follow-up with electromagnetic telescopes. And this is a, this is a, a nice confluence of circumstances because as the, the French-Italian Virgo detector comes online and LIGO sensitivity improves, our localization improves, these massive telescope facilities like large synoptic sky telescope are coming online. And so, you know, again, in terms of the roadmap of the future of the field, it will be to look at observations of the, um, from black holes you don't get any light, but from neutron star mergers you get light coming off the, the mergers. And so we can look at the joint observations of the light and gravity waves. Okay, so I think Peter is, I'd, I'd still like to thank the panel very much for, for them speaking with everyone here and telling us a bit about their discovery. And uh, Peter is going to uh, give us a couple comments here about what, wrapping up. Yeah, but yes, thank you again. This part of the, the program. Let's give it. Thank you again for joining us today uh, to celebrate history in the making. Before you run off to make the next big discovery, please join us for a brief reception in the rear of the auditorium. And as you've heard already, uh, please t take time to check out the workstations with large screens where you can learn more about this historic discovery. And please take a moment again to congr congratulate our team members, ask them questions, and learn more about the vast space-time landscape we call home. Have a great day. <laughs>